John Valvano here. I uh, hope your last two days were, were excellent. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, architecture, show some data flow graphs. Again, we're, we're in that review stage of uh, EE319K. I'm glad you're here. Let's have some fun. All right. Uh, data flow graph is one of our design documents. Uh, it looks a lot like the circuit diagram. So if you were to draw a circuit diagram of your embedded system, uh, you would see things like buttons. You would see circuits. Um, you would see inputs and outputs. And so the devices, the physical devices that we have in our system will be squares or rectangles in our data flow graph represent actual devices. The arrows in a data flow graph represent the data flow, the flow of information from one module to another. This is the data flow graph for lab three, which is an alarm clock. Uh, the circles will be software. And as we saw last time, we introduced this, this notion of a driver. A driver has how many files? three files. There's the H file, which is the uh, prototypes for the public function. The C file, which is the implementation of those functions, uh, both private and public. And then there will be a main.c, which we'll use for testing. Uh, these two files, the H and the C, exist here. Okay, so for both the inputs and outputs, we'll have drivers for those devices. All right. Uh, the other thing about the arrow is it, um, it is data. And so we'll see in the next one that we can use, uh, we can put more information on the arrow to specify what that data is, what type is it, uh, and the bandwidth or the amount of information flowing per second. And we'll use bandwidth in this class in two categories. Uh, when we talk about an analog signal, uh, we'll use bandwidth to say that the information exists between certain frequency components. And then we'll also use bandwidth in a digital sense, which will be the number of bits per second, the number of bytes per second, the number of samples per second. Uh, the Nyquist theorem is what we'll use to connect the two, uh, but nevertheless, we'll use bandwidth for two components. So again, the, uh, the, the squares or the rectangles represent physical devices. Uh, this is lab 10 which is our PI motor controller. Uh, the purpose of this system is to spin the motor at a constant speed. And uh, we are going to be able to measure that speed with a sensor. Uh, we'll use the timer chip to actually determine the speed by measuring the period of that square wave. And then we will affect the power to the system using a system called uh, pulse width modulation. And we'll talk more about that as we get closer to lab 10. Um, Again, the arrows represent data, and we're interested in both the bandwidth uh, and the direction, obviously, of which way things go. Uh, any questions on data flow graphs? So we'll draw them uh, as we go through each of the labs. Um, I mentioned that uh, we have a lot of buses okay, in the, on this architecture, and so there is a sp specific bus for just fetch and opcodes. Okay, to just to fetch opcodes, we'll use the iCode bus. Uh, we will be able to get data out of RAM using the system bus. And you can see that most of the I.O. ports also exist on the system bus. We'll be able to get into some of the peripherals uh, using the private bus. And we'll be able to access into the processor uh, with another bus, uh, which the debugger uses. Um, so that it can see inside the processor without having to stall the fetching of opcodes or the fetching of, of, of data from I.O. ports. One more bus, just to make things uh, fun and complicated. And it's uh, sort of confusing here, but if you look at this, uh, this output port right here, so if you look at port F, for instance, you'll see that port F exists on two buses. It exists both on the system bus and on this uh, high advanced high, high speed peripheral uh, bus. And it actually exists as two addresses. So if you look in the H file for the, for the IO uh, labels, you will see two definitions for port A, B, C, D, E, and F. 
And so I'll ask the general question, why are there so many buses? You can do more things in parallel. Yeah, the, the answer is, uh, the more we can do in parallel, the faster it will be. So can I fetch an opcode while pushing something on the stack? Yeah, yeah, I can, I can, every bus cycle, I can fetch an opcode. And if that bus, if that instruction needs to push or pop or write, read or write from memory, uh, it can do that at the same time it's fetching an opcode. Uh, why would you have two, why would you have two uh, addresses for the same port? The same reason. I can push something on the stack at the same time I'm reading from the port. Okay? It has to do with speed. Uh, if you see a computer where it uses a separate bus to fetch opcodes from reading and writing memory, that's called a Harvard architecture. All right. So it's all about speed. Now, when you program it, you don't know what bus it is, other than, other than choosing which definition to use for port F. The software doesn't choose which bus to go on. The hardware automatically chooses uh, the right way to go. Uh, so an interesting question, can I fetch opcodes out of RAM? The answer is I can, but it's slow. Okay? It's slower to execute software out of RAM. All right. Uh, it's a risk architecture, which means we have uh, very few instructions, and of course, uh, in the LC3, how many instructions should you have? 16. Uh, that's probably few. Uh, here we've got hundreds, 200, 300 opcodes, depending on how you count. Uh, and so whether you call the ARM, whether you call 300 or opcodes, 300 instructions, few, uh, maybe, maybe not. Um, on your LC3, the, each opcode, each instruction was how long? How many bits wide was an instruction, the machine code on a LC3? 16. And on the ARM, well, at least on the Cortex-M, okay, on the Cortex-M, we're going to have both 16 and 32-bit opcodes. Now, the thumb is all 16, and the ARM is all 32, but the Cortex-M is a mixture of the two. They call it thumb, uh, thumb architecture enhanced with uh, thumb two technology or something crazy like that, but the um, it is not fixed length. They got two lengths of opcodes, okay. Uh, but they do execute in one or two cycles. Uh, other than the divide instruction and the push multiple, uh, those are the long ones. Uh, it, the ARM does allow you does only lets you load and store memory using the load and store opcode. You, the add instruction, the multiply instruction, those don't fetch from memory. And you can only do one read or one write to memory. You can't do an instruction that does both read and write from memory. Uh, so, and as you can see, it has lots of general purpose registers. And we saw we have even more registers with a floating point. Uh, that is true. Uh, it's also true that the ARM has very few, very few addressing modes, you know, immediate and indexed and PC relative, and that's about it. Uh, what do you got to see in here? Uh, you got to see this. Um, in the IPSR is the interrupt number that tells you uh, if you're running an interrupt service routine, it'll tell you which, uh, which interrupt you're going. Um, uh, the T bit will always be set. I don't know, it's, that's the interesting part about there. Um, uh, we, did, we have 32 kibby bytes of RAM and 256 kibby bytes of uh, flash, uh, 43 I.O. pins. There will be two, there will be three ways to get at the I.O. port. So if you look at port F, for instance, port F, well, there will be four ways, but port F in the, in the system bus exists in this range here. So if we read and write port F, we get all eight, all, we get all of port F, which happens to only be five bits. Uh, we can also access port F using these addresses here. 
And in that way, we're going to get one bit at a time. And we'll see this in lab two when we get to uh, critical sections that we'll be interested in seeing, being able to address individual bits or on this architecture, individual clumps of bits without affecting the other bits. Uh, it turns out the RAM is also um, bit banded and so we can access individual bits of RAM if we want as well. Uh, it is little Indian, uh, which means when you store a 16-bit uh, value into, um, into RAM, which is all 8 bits wide, uh, the least significant byte goes here and the most significant byte goes there. Uh, but if you're storing a 32-bit number, again, the least significant byte goes first. It's little Indian. Uh, okay. Um, as we mentioned, the uh, interface in this class will be a combination of hardware, which is the physical, uh, the physical devices. We're going to be interested in all sorts of things like current, voltage, capacitance, resistance, inductance. These are all things that are going to be relevant for the interfacing, interfacing component, as well as the software, and we've already mentioned uh, the three types of software. Software for an interface is called the driver. And we talked about the three files already. All right, there are ports. This is the same processor we used in uh, 319K. Um, it's, it is fairly complicated. Uh, some of the complications are, are, are listed here. You see that uh, port A, bit 5, has two purposes. Actually, it's got three or four or five purposes. And you can, in software, select which bit does what or what what does each bit do? And we will see that we have the regular function where it's a port. It can be an alternate function like a serial or a, or a, or a timer. Or it can actually be an analog port as well. And so the analog 12 of the pins can be attached to the analog to digital converter. What else am I going to say here? Uh, a couple of these you sh with your launch pad you shouldn't touch. Uh, the PA lines are connected to the UART. Uh, the debugger gets these four. Um, so there are some pins that are, that are used for specific purposes. And you'll see that uh, when, you, when you go to do your designs. All right. uh, we listed some of the types of I.O. devices uh, previously. Uh, we have the serial devices. And that was one bit at a time. Um, we have the A to D converter, and we'll see this in lab two, um, that the voltage goes from 0 to 3.3 .3 volts, and that will convert it from 0 to 4,095. That's the A to D converter. We will use the um, ser synchronous serial interface or the serial peripheral interface. It's the other name for it. Serial peripheral interface, SPI. Uh, it's the same protocol. Uh, and we'll see it in two places this semester. It's what, how your liquid crystal display, how your software communicates to the liquid crystal display. And then we get to lab five, I think it is. Uh, we'll connect a digital to analog converter uh, using this protocol. And it's in doing lab five that we'll learn about this, this interface. Uh, as I mentioned, the reason why these are so popular, the reason why these are so effective is their ability to do time. And so this is a big deal. We will see that time and we'll create periodic interrupts, we'll generate square waves, we'll generate pulse width modulated output waves, we'll measure period, we'll measure frequency, we'll measure phase. Uh, these are all time related uh, uh, activities that will make this uh, make this microcontroller very, very effective. And so we will see lots of time, um, time related devices this semester. And it is the single most, re uh, in my opinion, the single reason why there are billions of these is because this is how the digital world has taken over the analog world, is because it can do in time things way better than the, the, the continuous circuits can do in, in analog space. Uh, I mentioned, um, I mentioned uh, bit banding. There's a second way to, 
to get at devices called bit specific addressing and this is only true for the ports the, the data pins of the port and not true for the direction or for memory um, and basically there for if you look at the base address for each of the ports okay so for each of the ports a b c d e and f there's a base address and if you want to access all of the bits of that port we're going to add the number 3FC and if we add the number 3FC you can see that will specify all of the bits of that port so the base address plus 3FC gets all of the pins of that port but if we're interested in just some of the pins like in this example here port A bit 321 can be accessed both write to and read from by using the base address plus the offset for bit uh, one, the offset for bit two, and the offset for bit three. In other words, if we create a, a IO register, an IO name with this address, we will get port A bits three, two, one. And it's a uh, very, very important, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a fancy trick to solve the problem that we'll see in lab two uh, with critical sections. And we'll talk about that couple of lectures. So in summary for this particular uh, component, for this particular lecture, I want you to uh, uh, draw your data flow graphs, uh, particularly when you do your project. I want to see how it all fits together. Again, this, this is one of the fun ones. This is one of the early ones. Uh, the microcontroller has memory and I.O. ports. Uh, it is a risk. It is a little Indian. And then we um, just listed some of the ports associated. So I have any questions on the microcontroller? Okay, he said, uh, since there's eight bits, there are indeed 200, yeah, so the question was, uh, uh, if you look at this, uh, if you look at this formula, how many different, how many different choices, how many different addresses could it access the port? Uh, some of them are, one of them is like really stupid. In other words, if I access 4,000, 4,000, what am I going to, what's going to happen? Nothing. I'm going to access none of the bits. It's a, it's a silly thing to do. Uh, whereas, uh, yeah, so any combination of eight makes 256 possibilities. Yeah, and it, it has to do with if you, look at, um, if you look at the memory map here, uh, it's not drawn the scale, right? Uh, this is the memory map. How many, how many uh, uh, bytes? are in the address space for this device. Well, how, how wide is the address? 32 bits. 32 bits. So 2 to the 32 is like uh, 4 uh, billion, right? OK, a big number, OK? So uh, but how many bytes of actual stuff do you have, right? 256,000 plus 32,000 plus some extras, way less than a million, okay? About a half a million different things in there, and you've got four billion addresses. So what do they do? So it's mostly empty. So what they've done is they've taken all those unused addresses and made a purpose out of them because silicon's cheap, right? Sand, right? Just, and so they can put a lot of transistors in there. So they've, they've created some tricks because you know that um, because if you look at port A, uh, we might want to only use a few of those pins for a particular interface. And that means I can write software that only accesses port A bit 1, 2, 3. Did I answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Any other questions on the device? All right, so next we're going um, <coughs> to uh, go further and talk about uh, synchronization. <coughs>